Well, hi everyone. Today I want to get into some other interesting aspects, I think, related to the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland. There's been some recent news that the FBI has opened up a criminal probe relative to the operation of the MV Dolly by the ship's crew. Sources say they'll determine whether the crew left the port knowing the vessel had serious systems problems. The mayor of Baltimore also announced the city hired a law firm to take legal action against anyone responsible and to hold them financially responsible. There's been a statement made by Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg where he made a statement to CNN. To be clear, if any private party is responsible for and accountable for this, they will be held accountable. So what I'm going to get into in this video is a couple things. The misdirection, I think, that's going on by federal officials to take any attention whatsoever about the role of the bridge owner in this uh, instance, the uh, Maryland Toll Authority. Do they have a, a duty to protect or provide warning systems to their bridge? I want to get into this from the aspect of engineering practice. And if any of you have been involved with well, just practicing engineering or certainly dealt with the business side of engineering, whether it's with your insurance carrier or hopefully you haven't had a professional liability claim. But these are all important considerations. And I'm asking the question, you know, should people in government entities, engineers in particular, be somehow exempt from following the standard of care to, that would otherwise lead them open to negligence claims and millions of dollars in, in settlement damages. Now let's look at this uh, brief segment of the press conference that uh, Pete Buttigieg, uh, Secretary of Transportation, gave following the collapse of the key bridge. Now for the bridge, uh, we are going to be working with NTSB as they lead their independent <clears throat> investigation. It's too early to speculate, of course, what NTSB will find, but if they discover or determine anything that should be considered in the regulation, inspection, design, or funding of bridges in the future, we will be ready to apply those findings. Well, I'm not so sure that uh, there's been a lot of lessons learned, unfortunately. There's been many previous episodes of bridge spans being taken out by collisions from ships, barges, and even trains. And uh, a few things changed, but not much. There's this 1991 Ashto guide that's since been updated basically going into detail how you perform a risk assessment for bridges relative to collision impacts from, say, barges or ships. And those recommendations were applied to future design and construction, leaving completely open the question of what do you do with existing bridges in busy waterways that are subject to being taken out by collisions. So we also had this NTSB report following the Bayou Cannot collapse near Mobile, Alabama, where a train plunged into a waterway because a barge had taken out the support piers. And again, there were recommendations about providing protection for having warning systems and the like. In 2001, there was a collapse of three spans on the Port Isabel Causeway Bridge in Texas, the bridge that leads to Padre Island. There were eight deaths in that incident. As a result, they rebuilt the collapse spans, provided an early warning ship collision system, some type of fiber optic system that would warn motorists if there was an issue with a, with a collision or a pending collision so they could get off the bridge. Uh, they also installed passive collision barrier systems, basically dolphins, around the key bridge piers uh, at, at the structure. So that's a site-specific example or project-specific example where lessons were learned and implemented for that specific bridge. But then how did other bridge owners look at the risk for their structures? You know, I've shown this slide in the past. It's a risk matrix. Now, the degree of risk for a situation is the combination of the probability and the severity. You can have a relatively infrequent event but if it occurs and the consequences are, are big, then it's a high risk situation. So you, you really can't argue that this type of bridge damage or catastrophic collapse is altogether unexpected. It's, it's rare, fortunately, it, it does happen, 
So it's not unexpected, but the consequences are huge. In the case of the Francis Scott Key Bridge, they're talking about over $2 billion in replacement costs for this bridge. There's been widespread disruption to the Port of Baltimore. There were six deaths associated with this collapse for the crew working on the bridge deck at the time. So these are big time consequences related to an event that could reasonably be expected at some point given enough time. Another important example is the Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Tampa, Florida. There was a freighter that took out key spans of that bridge due to, to a collision of the bridge pier. And again, uh, several deaths, and they went back and rebuilt the bridge. And this time around, they put in a system of dolphins, basically passive collision protection systems, so that those structures would take the brunt of the force from a wayward ship or barge rather than going straight into the bridge pier. All right, so let's listen to this next segment from Buddha Judge. What we do know is a bridge like this one, completed in the 1970s, was simply not made to withstand a direct impact on a critical support pier from a vessel that weighs about 200 million pounds, orders of magnitude bigger than cargo ships that were in service in that region at the time that the bridge was first built. Okay, so I gotta jump in here again. No bridge is designed for a, a major impact like this from a, a significantly sized cargo ship. You know, notice they use uh, units of weight in, in terms of pounds, 200 million pounds. I mean, 100,000 tons is a lot to conceptualize, but 200 million, even more difficult to conceptualize. And this is by design. They want to make it sound like, you know, this might as well have been an asteroid impact for all they could have anticipated. And again, that's simply not true. Also notice that he doesn't make any mention of passive systems or early warning systems that could have avoided or significantly reduced the risk of this bridge from the impact of a wayward uh, ship or barge. Now, this is a pretty decent question from a reporter at this press conference about, you know, how safe are our bridges in this country? We've seen now uh, several bridge collapses happen over the past couple of years. Obviously, this was a catastrophic, a catastrophic event, but that bridge fell very quickly. Uh, how concerned should Americans be about the bridges that they're traversing every single day in this country? Well, this is a, a unique circumstance. Uh, I do not know of a bridge that has been constructed to withstand a direct impact from a vessel of this size. Okay, they want to make it sound like it's unique. It's not. Other bridges have been taken out. There's been deaths associated with barge, ship, train impact on bridges. What I will say is anytime anything happens to any bridge, uh, we as a country take that and learn from that. Again, not so sure. It seems like the lessons are slow and, and applied uh, haphazardly across the country. Some owners are proactive and when they see an issue that wasn't part of the original design, they'll retrofit their project, whether it's to seismic upgrades, to prevent damage from earthquakes, or, and I'll show you some examples of other bridge owners before anything occurred at the Francis Scott Key Bridge, uh, that they took measures to protect their bridge piers out in, in major waterways that had significant barge and ship traffic. Uh, learning from incidents as diverse as what happened to uh, I-95 in Philadelphia. Okay, he cites I-95 in Philadelphia. There was a truck fire that caused structural damage because Concrete and steel for bridges isn't designed to have high heat from intense fires. So what was the lessons from that? I, I don't know. Did they ban transport of flammable materials in tankers and uh, pulled by trucks on our bridges across the country? No, I, I honestly don't know what, what the lesson was there. What happened to I-10 in Los Angeles? Okay, now he mentions I-10 in Los Angeles. That was a fire a few months back that uh, they think a homeless person started it. There was blocks and blocks of pretty much junk, uh, wooden pallets, tires, other industrial materials that went up in flames. I mean, it was basically a completely uncontrolled, uh, unregulated situation where people could store all these flammable materials directly underneath the roadway for, for I-10 in Los Angeles. And it was a complete mess. That whole situation made 
Fred Sanford's operation looked like a Gucci boutique. Uh, or uh, another case that we're learning a lot from here, which is the two, 2007 collapse uh, of I-35 West in uh, Minnesota. Wait a minute. I-35 in 2007, where a 1900 foot span of the bridge collapsed into the Mississippi River. That was related to structural defects of a gusset plate that wasn't as thick as it should have been. It was a design error and it wasn't picked up through subsequent inspections. I mean, here's what the NTSB had to say about it. Major safety issues identified in this investigation include insufficient bridge design, firm quality control procedures for designing bridges, and insufficient federal and state procedures for reviewing and approving bridge design plans and calculations. Lack of guidance for bridge owners with regard to the placement of construction loads on bridges during repair or maintenance activities. Exclusion of gusset plates in bridge load rating guidance. Lack of inspection guidance for conditions of gusset plate distortion. And inadequate use of technologies for accurately assessing the condition of gusset plates on deck truss bridges. Okay, I'm, I'm missing here what, what this has to do with the cargo ship hitting the bridge. So let's go back. Right now we know there's a federal investigation. Everyone's been focused seeming, seemingly on investigating the operation of the ship by its crew. That needs to happen. I'm not saying otherwise. But there seems to be a, an effort to just make this all about a ship going off course and hitting a bridge. There's really no discussion about whether this bridge was properly protected. I say there's no discussion. The, the media has posed questions to Maryland officials, and so far they've refused to answer those questions about the adequacy of the bridge protection here at the Key Bridge. Obviously, they were wholly inadequate. I pointed out in my very first video, the, the morning of this collapse, that uh, the dolphins, there was only four, one upstream, one downstream on each of the main piers for the main span, they were too small and they're too far away from the pier. And in fact, the MV Dolly, I don't think even contacted any of these dolphins before it impacted the bridge pier and took, took the bridge out. But the Maryland Toll Authority has engineers on staff. And, and why is that? Just like with the DOT, there are engineers on staff. They have to administer design and construction contracts for new bridges. They have to administer maintenance and inspection contracts and activities and they have to assess what the risks are for their bridge over time due to a variety of factors. So what I'm gonna get into here in detail is what is the standard of care for engineers in general and to what extent did Maryland engineers with the toll authority either follow or not follow the standard of care and to the extent that may be the case, what's their liability likely going to be? And I'm going to refer to this document here for a few sections. Now I'm going to have a few excerpts from this white paper. This was put out by the American Council of Engineering Companies, and it's giving guidance on what it means to follow a standard of care for engineering practice. Now I think this is worth reading here. Most structural engineers understand that they should perform their engineering services with no less than the skill customarily exercised by other, in this case, structural engineers in similar circumstances. Most likely their employer or a colleague told them so at some point in their early careers, or they overheard other engineers discussing the issue in the context of a legal action. But beyond this probably brief introduction to the issue and perhaps a few casual conversations here and there, it is reasonable to assume without the benefit of a poll that most engineers aren't particularly familiar with professional liability laws governing their profession, aren't conversant on legal specifics or potential legal pitfalls, and don't know how the legal system would deal with them should their professional acts or omissions be alleged to have caused harm to another party. So if you're in professional practice, you really need to be familiar with what the standard of care is and to make sure you follow it so that you limit your legal exposure. We're not talking criminal exposure, which the FBI seems to be looking at here with the crew of the MV Dolly, uh, they're probably looking at criminal negligence but in terms of professional practice, this is a civil liability. Now there could be licensure implications too relative to an individual or their company, but let's look at the, the aspects of, of big damages related to liability related to not following the standard of care. So let's look at a definition of standard of care. Standard of care, the firm shall perform the work in a manner consistent with that level of care and skill ordinarily exercised by members of the profession currently practicing under similar conditions in the same locale. The firm makes no warranties or guarantees 
express or implied relating to the firm's services, and the firm disclaims any implied warranties or warranties imposed by law, including warranties of merchantability and fitness for a particular purpose. In other words, a professional practice, there's no warranties, there's no guarantees, but you're expected to do things in a manner that's consistent with other professionals with, uh, involved with similar projects in your given geographic area. And really there's not vast differences in terms of engineering practice across the country. So let me give you an example. I'm, I'm a geotechnical engineer. Let's say somebody comes to me to design the foundation for a high rise office building. And ordinarily you would be expected to do a site specific geotechnical investigation. You'd get a geotechnical drill rig. You would drill soil and rock samples. You would test those samples. You would determine their engineering properties. And then you would do a design on the appropriate foundation that should be used for that, that facility or that building. Now let's say somebody decides, you know, I'm going to try and save the owner some money, or maybe I'm going to try and get this job and be really competitive or somehow get in the good graces of this developer. And, you know, I've got a buddy that designed the foundations for another high rise building two miles away. And uh, I'm just going to assume that the site conditions for my building are going to be similar to those. And I'm just going to review the information, the subsurface information from that report for this building two miles away. Well, that wouldn't be following the standard of practice. I don't, I don't care where you are. Uh, I saw this recently for the design of some pile foundations for a bridge in my area. It was a relatively small bridge, but still it was important. It was a public roadway. And the piling, I, I, I cautioned the contractor. I said, it's anybody's guess where these piles are going to take up. And that was because the geotechnical investigation consisted of two auger borings without sampling. So all they did was log the material and turned out, instead of 70 foot long pile, they all hung up at 25 feet because they failed to document the location of the bedrock. They just logged it all as clay. So. Again, they didn't follow the standard of care in that case. So let's see how an act or omission can get you in trouble. This is under common law or what's known as a tort. A tort is an act or omission that gives rise to injury or harm to another and amounts to a civil wrong for which courts impose liability. In the context of torts, injury describes the invasion of any legal right, whereas harm describes a loss or detriment in fact that an individual suffers. So for our purposes as practicing engineers, we want to avoid negligent acts that's going to get us sued and perhaps have a judgment against us. There's basically three types of torts. The first and the third really don't apply in most cases. Let's look at the main one here. Negligence. Negligence arises out of the failure to exercise the requisite degree of care with regard to a party to whom you owe a duty. An engineer might be alleged to have been negligent in the performance of his or her services through his or her actions or non-action. The injured party must demonstrate that an injurer was at fault using the negligence standard to win a financial settlement. So if you want to think about acts or omissions, it reminds me of the old poem by Ogden Nash. It's called Portrait of the Artist as a Prematurely Old Man. And this has stuck with me. I always think about it relative to professional liability. So I'm just going to read the first few lines here. It is common knowledge to every schoolboy and even every Bachelor of Arts that all sin is divided into two parts. One kind of sin is called a sin of commission, and that is very important. And it is what you're doing when you're doing something that you oughtn't. And the other kind of sin is just the opposite and is called a sin of omission and is equally bad in the eyes of all right-thinking people, from Billy Sunday to Buddha. And it consists of not having done something you should have. I think that pretty well sums it up. But again, I'm going to read one other definition, and then let's relate it to what's going on in Maryland with these government officials and their responsibility as an engineering organization that is administering the, the tolls and the operation and maintenance of an important bridge in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Since negligence is often alleged in civil actions against structural engineers, really any engineers here for our purposes, it is important that engineers understand the definition of negligence and know under what circumstances a structural engineer could be found negligent. Negligence has been defined as the failure to exercise the care that a reasonable person would use in similar circumstances. Professional negligence is the term that applies to the care used by members of a profession. 
law, medicine, architecture, engineering in the course of providing professional services. Putting this in an engineering context, negligence is a failure to exercise the care and skill that is ordinarily exercised by other members of the engineering profession in performing professional engineering services under similar circumstances. So let's go through what it takes to be found negligent. To be found negligent and in breach of the standard of care, several points have to be proven by the plaintiff. One, the defendant owed a legal duty to the plaintiff. Two, the defendant breached that duty by failing to exercise reasonable care through his or her actions or non-actions. Three, there was an actual and legal cause and effect relationship between the alleged negligent acts and the harm. And four, the plaintiff suffered harm. Well, I think, uh, again, I know there's lawyers that are regular viewers of this channel. I'd be interested in what your opinion is relative to the Maryland Toll Authority and their engineering department. Is it reasonable for them to just say, hey, this bridge was designed and built in the 70s. We couldn't have anticipated that these cargo ships would have gotten so big, even though there were other owners who around that same time period were providing passive protections to their bridge structures. Uh, I did a recent video talking about the Port of New York where they constructed dolphins around their bridge piers. This was done in the, in the 60s and 70s. So does Maryland Toll Authority get a pass? So part of the standard of care is what other people are doing in your area. So for the Delaware River and Bay Authority, they started constructing protective dolphins around the Delaware Memorial Bridge in 2023. So last year, and this project's gonna be completed in 2025. So they started this project over a year before anything happened here with the Key Bridge. They also implemented protective islands around the bridge piers out in the river at the Commodore Berry Bridge. And they also have already installed protective dolphins around the piers for the Betsy Ross Bridge. So what do you think? Do you think potential plaintiffs in this situation, relatives of the victims that uh, died as a result of the key bridge collapse uh, would have a basis for suing Maryland authorities because they didn't follow standard of care relative to protecting their existing bridge. I mean, they've been collecting millions of dollars in tolls for this bridge uh, up until the time of the collapse. Is it possible that the owners of the MV Dolly might seek some type of civil suit against Maryland officials for saying that, yeah, they may have had their part in, in the collapse of the bridge, but had Maryland officials implemented reasonable and perhaps by some measure, even customary measures to protect their bridge from impact, the damages wouldn't have been as great or they may not have occurred at all. So these are interesting to me questions. And I think it's important to keep a broad view of what's going on here and not let government officials hide the P and basically say, well, look at the ship owner and what they did, the crew did, and you know, nothing to see here relative to government officials. I, I'm not uh, in favor of that at all. And I also don't want other bridge owners to say, well, it happened in Baltimore. I'm, I'm fine where I'm at, not protecting my bridge structure. So I want to send a shout out to channel members. Thanks very much for your continued support. It uh, means a lot to me. I also appreciate those of you who provided super thanks. And of course, those of you who have liked, subscribed, and left a lot of interesting and in-depth comments. I really enjoy the engagement on these videos. So thanks very much, and please stay tuned for future videos.